Well, we'll shift gears uh, now. Uh, an activity that, uh, that we've been working on uh, since I came to the FDA uh, seven years ago uh, was to think about how we would bring pharmacologic mechanism uh, into the equation uh, when we're thinking about trying to understand uh, drugs, uh, drug safety, adverse drug events, both in, in the pre-marketing arena and in the post-marketing arena. Because frankly, at the present time, uh, that it, especially after drug is released for the market, most of the assessment is really a pharmacoepidemiologic or uh, essentially what we call accounting the body's exercise. And we think that that's really unfortunate because that really doesn't bring into the equation understanding how the drug works and how that might, uh, might uh, add information with regard to prediction of risk so that we would be in a better position uh, to look for it. Where does an activity like this fit? Well, current safety efforts, uh, preclinical toxicology, what we'd call farm tox. There are efforts and quantitative structure uh, activity relationship uh, uh, studies. Uh, something called the Sentinel Initiative, which is another form of pharmacoepidemiologic studies for which there is a denominator that is known, uh, as you heard in the last presentation, in the spontaneous reporting database. Uh, that's been uh, often said to be the main weak or a major weakness of that. So the Sentinel Initiative currently has enrolled, I think, uh, around a couple hundred million people in the United States uh, for which data are being generated uh, with a, a better understanding of uh, how many people are being exposed in relationship to the adverse events that are seen. This is, this is uh, in an early phase, and so uh, this effort is, is moving forward. Uh, however, there's much work to be done. Uh, with regard to this activity that I'll, I'll be talking about in the next few minutes, um, it started fairly recently. Uh, initially, we worked uh, to understand uh, just using uh, data mining approaches uh, to see if we could, uh, could better understand uh, drug action and where that might fit mechanistically. Uh, but it was quite clear that, that new tools need to be developed. And with the evolving uh, areas of integrative and systems pharmacology, uh, the idea was to pick a selected area uh, and to try to develop these approaches uh, using integrated databases uh, and, and analytical methodologies uh, to see how well we can do predictive toxicology. So that we uh, discussed this in a review paper uh, now, I guess, three years ago, uh, to outline what we thought a program like this would look like, the kinds of data sources that need to be brought to bear, uh, and then how they might be integrated. And so uh, this would be a 100,000-foot view of some of our thinking. And that would be many different diverse, many, uh, diverse data streams. Uh, where is the mark? Here we go. Uh, anywhere from chemical information uh, to genomic information, transcriptomic information, uh, and, pheno and then clinical phenomic information. And then how to integrate, how to link those, because those are very different data types. The, the, uh, the uh, composition of the data is very different, its organization is very different, and it's created by very different groups of people. So an approach to that kind of problem is to use formalized methods in ontology uh, to do relational networking between uh, very uh, diverse data types. Uh, there may be some familiar, familiarity here with that. Uh, Mark Musen uh, here in the faculty uh, uh, was heading up the National Centers for Biomedical Ontology here at Stanford uh, and really uh, did, did great things in providing a framework to understand how to do these relational uh, uh, structures. And so we, we said, uh, said early in the program that we need to think about expanding these relational networks to uh, adverse drug reactions because <clears throat> the, the ontologies that were existent at, at that time uh, many people here are probably familiar with the gene ontology or GO. Uh, there's the cell line ontology, the human phenotype ontology, et cetera. So in each of these areas, using uh, the formalized uh, approaches that, that Musen and the, the uh, consortium of centers developed over the last decade, uh, they had been organized but not linked together 
and the clinical phenotype of adverse drug reactions had not been incorporated because uh, simply that had not been the interest of, of investigators. So the ontology of adverse events is an effort that we've been building on. It was initially started at the University of Michigan uh, to link vaccine-related adverse events to biology. Uh, and, and that seemed like a reasonable basis to start and then expand to think of drug adverse events. The issues are, are quite different. With a vaccine, it's usually administered to a healthy person so that an adverse outcome that may occur uh, may well be likely due to the exposure. A drug adverse event, well, this is oftentimes a drug that's being administered to a patient with an underlying disease process, and if something bad happens, one has to ferret out whether it's related to the disease process, to the drug, or a combination of the two. And, and so uh, we have been working for the last now four years in building out the ontology of adverse events, uh, including uh, specific adverse event terms. Uh, for better or for worse, adverse drug events are coded in a, a vocabulary called MEDRA. Uh, that has many challenges that we could discuss, but it's really the terminology that we're left with because it's an international standard. Uh, you see the link there if you're interested in learning more about OAE. But what does it look like? Well, this is, this is then linking uh, the relational terms. And here we would be thinking about what exists in the ontology of adverse events, putting that into an anatomic uh, location in the body. Uh, the ontology called Uberon has organized that data, uh, putting that into to then uh, the, the underlying uh, genetic and uh, uh, biochemical pathways that are very much resident in the gene ontology, and then relating these to each other. Now, to do this, of course, we need data. And uh, the usual response is, well, the FDA has all the data, so why don't you just use it? Um, the truth is that the uh, data that the FDA indeed does have is owned by the drug companies, and we need their permission to use it. Um, and so. Uh, we're in the process of developing what we're calling a drug safety data warehouse. Uh, a, a, a person who's working especially on this is calling it a knowledge environment, which uh, we hope is, is uh, realistic. And this is simply an outline of the kinds of, uh, of structure and data that will go into this drug safety data warehouse uh, with, again, the, across the various kinds of data uh, streams, uh, linkage among them. There's tremendous opportunity here for collaboration. We're currently collaborating with a number of people who are working uh, in this space, both with regard to integration of data and then with regard to computational problem solving of problems in these very complex systems. Because almost never will these, the, the biological system be sufficiently defined to use a, a ordinary differential equations to solve problems. Instead, approaches such, such as uh, Boolean approaches and others that can use incomplete data sets to come to reasonably quantitative solutions, uh, we believe are, are the way to move forward there. So with regard to this, how is this uh, working and being supported? Well, there's an ongoing effort uh, uh, in the FDA, but really most of this is collaborative with academic and uh, institutions and the pharmaceutical industry, and importantly, a couple institutes at NIH. The National Cancer Institute has helped us a lot with developing the, the clinical phenotype in cancer clinical trials. Uh, the phenotype of the cancer is very well characterized. The phenotype of the rest of the patient is not very well characterized at all. And so to have a, a clear description of whether a cardiac toxic event of, of congestive heart failure, for example, uh, is very difficult. So uh, NCI has funded supplements in their clinical trials, pr trials program to validate approaches to do careful cardiac phenotyping. Uh, the current approaches are probably two-dimensional echocardiograms with strain measurements. Uh, the, the ideal, of course, would be to have cardiac MRI on all of these patients. The general sense is that that just is not feasible in large clinical trials. In any case, that's ongoing and looks very promising. 
Uh, NIGMS has been sponsoring the Centers for Systems Pharmacology and Systems Biology, uh, and that's been very helpful uh, with uh, collaborating groups. And there are a number of academic groups. Uh, at currently, we are working with two pharmaceutical companies to provide raw data from the companies uh, from their failed compound development programs and other programs they're interested in. Uh, and then the Systems Biology Institute in, uh, at, in Japan has been very helpful, uh, as has, is the European Bioinformatics Institute. I have a, a number of acknowledgments, as ev everyone else does. We'd love to add some of you to this list of acknowledgments because we think there's a real opportunity here from some, for some really interesting science that we believe can, can be very helpful. Thanks.